Welcome to season two of Narrative Worlds, and thank you for being here. I'm your host, Kate Elliott. Um, we had like no technical problems all season one, which means we're starting season two with technical problems, which means that my guest, Fonda Lee, and I are speaking to each other and not to any of you. Um, but Fonda is going to return in March, and we're going to have this conversation again, only even more expanded and with people. Um, so, but for now, um, we're going to talk about the idea of narrative worlds and the theory and practice of building them. And specifically today, we're going to talk about, oh, wait, but wait, there's more. Fonda is my guest today, Fonda Lee. She's the world fantasy award winning author i still can see you standing up there shaking a little as you made your victory <laughs> speech <laughs> it was great um at baltimore 2018 she's the world fantasy award winning author of jade city which is volume one of the green bone saga its third and concluding volume jade legacy is out this month vonda has also written um uh, three young adult novels, Zero Boxer, and the Exo Duology. And do you have anything to add, Fonda? Uh, no, I think you covered it. It's great to be here. And I, I, I if you're if you're watching this on YouTube after it's recorded, you get a kind of a two for one because we can't answer your questions. But um, but uh, definitely we will find another chance to we for will us to do that. So you suggested this exact title which i was completely delighted by go big or go home that's right bringing hefty themes structures and influences to doorstopper novels which you and i have both written <laughs> and so i want to start with a comment length is not by itself scope comment definitely uh length is uh i believe um something that ought to be uh in conversation with scope and have relationship to scope yeah. however um that is not always the case uh, there are definitely times where you read a book that feels like the length and the scope are not in sync I think we can probably all think of books like that, where you feel like there was either um, too much length for the amount of story, or there was too much story for the amount of length. So um, it's, it's finding that right uh, re balance um, in which you your length and your scope are working together, and it and ideally you have readers finish the last page of the book and have the sense of satisfaction because it was the right amount for what they signed up for. Um, it's kind of like, it's, it's almost like if you go to a restaurant and you're going to a, if you're going to a buffet, you are expecting a certain amount of food. And if you go to a very shishi French restaurant uh, that is doing a tasting menu, you are expecting a different experience. And if those those expectations are not met because the no. amount of what you're getting relative to what you're signed up for doesn't match. You're going to end up with a dissatisfied reader. Um, so uh, so yes, length length is not scope. Um, however, there are definitely times, as you and I know, when scope is the determinant of the length of our novels. Yeah that you can't when sometimes people say well why couldn't it be shorter but sometimes and i genuinely believe this it sometimes it can't be shorter because you begin to miss the things that create scope so why don't we talk about what is scope i i feel like scope is hard to define because it encompasses a number of things um, I think of it in a somewhat nebulous manner as the size of the canvas that I'm working on. Yeah. And have you ever seen the Night Watch, Rembrandt's The Night Watch? Yes. Have, have you stood in front of it and gone like, holy, right? It's huge. It's huge. 
Yeah. And it, and it works that big. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so as a prose writer, right, our, our canvas um, can be anything from a locked room mystery with a single point of view character to a epic secondary world fantasy spanning centuries of events. And that, uh, that canvas that you're playing with um, is really part of your vision for that story. Like what type of story are you trying to tell? Um, what experience are you trying to give the reader? And so when someone says, well, why couldn't it be shorter? They're neglecting the fact that uh, that may not be, that's not the experience that you're promising the reader when you are telling a large yeah. story with a large scope. Um, and the scope in my mind uh, can, has, has a number of variables. There is the number of point of view characters that mm -hmm. you're following. That's one element of scope. There is the time uh, passage, um, the amount of, of events um, that you're covering. That's another element of scope. There is a thematic element to scope. How many ideas um, are you trying to, 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 to deal with? Um, and, uh, and then the amount of, of world building, I think, is another element of scope. How familiar is it to the reader? Is it something that they are going to have to learn versus, you know, it's, a, I don't know, an apartment in New York that is, that you, they don't have to do a lot of, of learning about. So, um, and I'm, I'm sure there's many more that, that we could think of, but there's, there's aspects of that, uh, of scope that altogether kind of determine um, how much you're going to have to put on the page in order to tell the story that you're trying to tell. You know, it's interesting because I wrote down time, distance, cast, theme right well, like, we there we go same. there yeah. we go and, yeah yeah and uh and again a locked room mystery is a perfect example of something of a perfect story when told yes. well right. but it isn't the same as you know lord of the rings with these layers of history that touch upon each other yeah um or or the Greenbone saga where you, well, anyway, I have some thoughts about how you architecturally built that because it was fascinating to me to watch you do it. Um, and it was wonderful because I love big books and I cannot I, I lie. Also, like big <laughs> right? books. And fan but, of chunky books. I love, yeah. But I mean, so the heart of this to me is that even before you begin, is this that point of conceptualization yes if you've got to it's not a matter of saying oh I wrote and I don't say this as a criticism but it's not a matter of saying oh I wrote this book and it sold well I'm going to add two more on right it's a matter right. of it, the conceptualization is your foundation absolutely of, of the whole story and it's that you it's got to be big enough to hold everything yes yeah I think that so much of world building and, and doing it well is about making deliberate choices. And mm -hmm. so there's a difference between a situation where uh, a, the story got away from the writer, where they um, maybe they, they conceived it as one thing and then it kind of spiraled out of control and ended up being this like 150,000 word thing with five subplots that are unnecessary to their initial vision and then they have to like cut it down. Um, so there's the sort of unintentional length from, from bloat or from just the process kind of getting away from right. you. And we've all had that right. experience where we realize, okay, this, this was unnecessary and like, let's, let's cut this out and, and bring it back to what, it, what it's supposed to be. Yeah. But that is a different situation than when one in which you are conceiving um, the the architecture of a story where you know like up front okay this is going to be a two bedroom home versus this is going to be a cathedral and if you have conceptualized it as this is going to be a cathedral you have different choices to make up front right when you start yeah. laying the foundation in order for it to be able to support a cathedral 
Absolutely. I, I like that. That's a, that's a great example too. One of the examples I've used when people think if someone wants to write a big trilogy with a big scope and they're not quite sure how to go about it, I like to use actually, so your trilogy is a good example of this. So is Lord of the Rings, where the first book is like, we're going to go look at this house. It's got one story, maybe an attic, and we're going to explore it. That's my, right. now, now we've got that. But then it turns out there's a stairway that goes to another larger area that's up higher. That's book two. And now all of a sudden you're above and bigger than that house. You're seeing more. And then the third one, and then you have to go up like, so it's like expanding vectors. Yes. So yes. I, I just, I want to use this. I have to say this because you did this so brilliantly with Greenbone the Greenbone saga, where in the first Jade City, it's Jen Loon, right? Yeah. You learn the city, you learn the world, you learn what's going on, you understand the aesthetic that you're setting up. And then with the second book, you add that distance, right? Yeah. Now we go overseas. And, and as a child of diaspora, I'm a diaspora child. My mother is an immigrant. My father is the grandchild of immigrants from the same place my mother came from. I just so identified with how you brought diaspora in. Well, that adds this whole level to it. Now it's bigger. It's not the same as the first book. Right. Without in any way making the first book. And then in the third book, of course, you add the vector of time. I mean, you add yes. other vectors as well. You add global change. I mean, it's just amazing. It's amazing what you do. You, but you add that. The, the simplest way to say is you add the vector of time and the next generation. Yes. Um, yeah. And so each one gets. So it's like this. It's like an inverted pyramid. Right. But the foundation is so strong because you didn't try to do too much in the first book. Right. Right. And I think that's really important to keep in mind when you are planning a trilogy is you have to think, even if you know these books are going to be big and they're, you're, you're working with a large campus, you have to think just as much about what your story is not. Because you have to have, because, because it is big, you also have to have a clear sense of what your guardrails are and for yes. me I knew that at the, that the heart of the story was this family saga about this generation of characters and their conflict with this rival clan and that was uh the fence that allowed me to say this is where I'm not going to go I'm not going to start an additional subplot with uh, what is going on in this other country with a whole new cast of characters. Um, I'm not going to jump into the far future and now we are in space. Like I'm not, I'm not going, so I, there are things that I was not going to do. And within those guardrails of, of what the story, the vision for the story is and what the heart of the story is, then I can think about and, and plan for, you used this term, I think in a, in a blog post that you did once that I loved, you called it the architectural trilogy. And now I use that term a lot. I, um, it's, yeah. it, it just makes so much sense to me. It's so intuitive because that's really how I think about it was there's that, there, there's that foundation that I built with the first book. And then here's how I'm going to build on the second one with international conflict and the third with intergenerational. Um, and then there's, so I've got the, the scaffold um, of the trilogy and I also have the fence around the trilogy. So um, I think that sometimes the, the, the uh, danger that we face as, as big epic fantasy writers is where do you stop? You could just keep going and going and going. And, um, and, and some do, right? Like there are, some, there are definitely writers who, who you, you can, and I'm, I happen to be one of those writers where I do not want to end up spinning Writing into a, a 10 book, book narrative. Trilogy. That's seven right, like, <laughs> exactly. Like, like, learn from me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I had to think like, okay, I know these are going to be big books, but what is going to, what's going to be the ultimate focus of them? And then within that context, what's the layer cake? 
you know, and it's interesting because I think of that in a way as the spine, but I love this idea of a fence. You put, you could, the world is clearly there. There's that sense of this world churning on with all these changes outside the focus, but that fence keeps the focus. It keeps like this spine of the plot because if you, as you said, if it gets too big, it just, it, it becomes mush. You know, right. you can't, you know, and you've got to keep that middle point that focus, but and I wanted to come back to this idea of the architecture and the foundation and that sometimes I think people, people may, and this is a personal opinion, that people may get caught up in wanting to show how big their world is in book one. But if the world is too big, yes. and if it's not related at all to our, if it's a secondary world and not directly related to ours, it's like almost too much for people for readers to, to like, to bring into themselves because yeah. you're learning, readers learn the world the same way we learn when we go to a new city, the same way we learn when we meet new people. And if everything hits all at once, you know, so you, so when building a big book trilogy or series, you've got to figure out where you want to start and you have to situate that in a way that it sets the spine as you did. Again, I'm gonna keep using you because you're a good example, to, you're a perfect example to use with Jade City. It's that, that's about the family conflicts between the two clans and it sets the stage. But if, because everything builds on that, it's a big enough story by itself. But because everything builds on that, you didn't start too big by showing us communities overseas. Right, right. Which would have been, what, and for the other thing is, and the great thing about what you did with Jade War is by the time we read book one, we understand a fair amount. So now when we see these diaspora communities in Jade War, we're like, oh, oh, look what they're doing. Oh, I see how that functions. Now we are bringing as the readers bring what they learned from book one into their interactions with book two and book three. And that's something I think a writer needs to think about Mm -hmm, as they mm -hmm. expand because if you get once you get big enough the reader can juggle it all and yeah. get that personal you never want to learn lose that personal I mean there are writers who write these kind of what do we call the galactic story which is more about I don't you know what I mean yeah yeah that, yeah that yeah and that's fine it's just but you don't want to lose that for me as a reader and a writer yeah. you don't want to lose that personal focus yeah yeah I, I agree completely I feel like um, you know, you want this experience for the reader in which they sink into the world uh, with um, a minimal amount of friction. And, yes. you know, you yeah. ideally, and, and this goes to your choice of characters as well. Um, there's a, you know, the, the sort of cliched uh, setup in which you have like the farm boy character and you kind of stay with that sort of character and then they that character goes to you know the the city and then they end up at the capital and like the the sort of you start very sort of granular with this character and, and their yeah. adventures grow but the reason i think that that is a common approach is because it works you know there's you when you start with the character and their circumstances um and how their life is in a relatively contained field of view then you take you gradually widen the scope of that um, lens uh, through their experiences and the reader goes along with you. Um, I, uh, I think about the way that I started Jade City um, with a, a minor character because um, I could have plopped the reader right into a political negotiation between, you know, the major clans and they would have been like it, it, their perspective is such that they already know this world. They know how it works. They know the titles and how, you know, the, the magic system functions. And so they're not going to explain that. And right. that would be a confusing way for the reader to enter the world. So I made the choice to start with a minor character who is very uh, simple minded in his motivations. He's the thief. He wants to steal this jade. And that's how I'm going to introduce this world and and how it works 
and then you meet the the real main characters and and you it's more of a um an effortless entry point and on a broader level you can apply that to the overall book and to the trilogy as a whole as well um if you're going to tell a centuries spanning um epic uh you don't want to start with immediately plopping the reader into a, a council room meeting with 10 kings and their lineages and all of their all the secondary characters and have the reader like flipping the glossary to learn 25 names in the first chapter uh, that's so, why we don't start lord of the rings with elrond's council exactly right right it's like it's like yeah. what the heck is going on who are these people <laughs> yeah so um there's a it, it it's uh it's important to know where you're where you're going in terms of the scope and what its limits are but then also like step by step how you're going to build the whole view of the canvas in a way that your reader comes along with you and and understands what's happening and doesn't feel like immediately overwhelmed by the size of the world yeah. and the story because if you get far enough into it, once you get far enough into it, like I, as, as I've mentioned earlier, I, um, this spring, I read the third volume of Ken Liu's Dandelion Dynasty trilogy, which is a monstrously huge book. It's called The Veiled Throne, and it's coming out in the U.S. in a couple of weeks because of supply chain delays. Um, and I, it's, it's a, it's a long book, but I don't need much introduction now. I've read the first two. Right. And there is always that risk with the series that people who read the first book don't want to go on. Well, you'll lose them. But you know, that's a choice you're making from the get go, right? Uh, as as a writer, when you decide you want to write this, you got to, if you want to write a big book trilogy or series, you have to just accept that you want to write it for your own creative reasons. But But what I found reading it was that I did it. it. It's it's those stakes all felt real to me because I mm -hmm. knew the world so well because of all the setup he had done, yes. piece by piece over the two previous volumes. Yeah. And that's your investment. And that's one of the advantages to me of this big book trilogy or series. By the time people get in, they are invested. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they can draw, as you said, they can draw those links yourself. So there's moments in Jade War and in Jade Legacy where I would see things coming because you were letting me know as the reader or a small moment would happen and I'd go, ah, right? Because <laughs> I was putting the connections. You didn't have to tell me because right. we'd already been together all this time. And that's what I love about these books. Um, but it takes a lot of building and layering. And, and can you, yes. since you've just finished doing that, can you talk about that? Yes. There is. You can uh, cry first. And then yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do? Why am I doing I know. There were, I mean, there were definitely times um, it, during the writing of this trilogy where it just felt like there were, I was, there were so many things that I had to keep track of. There were so many threads. The book was so long. How it just yeah. felt overwhelming. I'm sure you I can relate to those oh, moments I'm, where you're like, oh, yeah. what have I done? I am never doing this again. What did I sign up for? Um, and I, I think though that the, the beauty of, of these big stories um, is that they demand investment from both the writer and the reader. Yeah. And so yeah. you are, your, your readership is self-selecting because these are readers who are like, I am signing up to be immersed and uh, to be, to give you many, many hours. This isn't like, I, this is not a, hey, I picked up the paperback off the spinning rack at the airport and I'm going to pound through this on an airplane ride. This is, these are readers who are signing up um, for a, for a lot of, uh, of, of time and mental energy, um, yeah. that they're going to yeah. give to you and they, they trust yeah. you. 
So yeah. there's a certain layer, additional layer of responsibility that you feel as a writer yeah. Uh, yeah. where you're like, I, I mean, if I write a, a short story and it, it, it's like, eh, then like, okay, fine. Like it's a short story. Like that yeah. costs them, you know, 15 minutes of their time. But right. if I write right. an epic doorstopper novel that is disappointing, that doesn't live up to my standards or, or the reader's standards, that is... Uh, that it, that's disastrous from my point of view because um, they've they are in, they're they're trusting you so much more, um, yeah. and yeah. they and, and so um, it really does break your brain sometimes <laughs> to think about to, to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, did you use like I? I you know, when writing Furious Heaven, which I'm now doing the final revisions on, yeah. I, w before I started it, I, I use lots of pieces of paper. I use big pieces of paper while I'll write lines of plot lines. Um, I have a storyboard for Dead Empire, the second Black Wolves novel, which just will never be erased. They're sitting right there, look, staring at me. Um, but, but there's also a lot of it that's churning in my head. And there was a point in Furious Heaven, which is very long, where I was like, I know that these two plot lines are necessary and I know why they're necessary, but I'm not, I'm not feeling it yet. I don't, I don't understand yet. It just like, am I wrong? Right. Am I yeah, wrong yeah. about it? And then they slipped in. I got to right, the point right. where they slipped in and I was like, no, I was right. Yeah. Um, but so sometimes it's a matter of patience. Yeah. And trusting yourself as the writer to say this does thematically need to be there. It does physically in terms of events and character need to be there, but it's just going to take a while. Yes. Unfold. So yes. do you use like storyboard or Scrivener or? Yeah. I, I'm really curious to hear how you do it. Um, I often feel like I'm just trying like everything that might work. You know, <laughs> like, I, I don't, I don't have a solution. <laughs> I yeah, there's tried. never a magic bullet. There's oh, just like, yeah. well, let's try so this. Well, let's try yeah. this. Um, so I have had, I, I have gotten the really big easel sized um, post-it notes where I've done like mind maps and stuck them on the wall. I have um, done, I have many, many files in Scrivener. I have done like all sorts of spreadsheets, post-it notes. I have this intense Aeon timeline file that has like every event that has happened in this, oh that it is God. narratively um, significant in the world. Um, and uh, I remember I, I was in copy edits. I think it was for Jade War. And um, I, it was, there were so many uh, time consistency uh, th things that I had to make sure were working and yes, work. my family went away for a camping trip for Labor Day weekend and I spent three straight days figuring out like every event in the like in the saga so far and timing uh, the, how they all worked out because there were things like um, you know the uh, a conversation between characters but um, I had to remember like what age are their kids in this scene and I had like a scene where um the kids are having a conversation but then because the scene moved I realized oh those kids are like 18 months old they can't have that conversation <laughs> and so all these you know there's so many moving pieces um and so many um threads that need to be stitched into the tapestry um and uh and you're right. There's times where you you have to just trust that it'll it'll work out somehow, um, and and then go back. And I I find that it's just like it, you layer on you you deal with the big stuff, then you deal with the slightly less overwhelming stuff, and then like you just keep you go over and over and over again until you reach a point where even like the smallest thread is 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 visible to you because you've yeah gone through it over so like at the very end you're starting to do things you're you're able to tug on even the small things like oh yeah that character that got mentioned in chapter three 
is going to actually be useful back at, over here in chapter 47. Um, and uh, and what's, what's cool is at the end of it all, your readers will notice that stuff. Like they actually yeah, will absolutely. Be they'll be like, oh yeah, that, I loved how that minor character came back in chapter 47. And like, that's really satisfying. Fond is a genius, even though <laughs> yeah. I just said, wait, I have a character I can use here. <laughs> like, exactly. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, wait, I'm there. I got to save myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that's, you, that, I, 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 I want to know how you do it. Like what have, what like, cause there's always those moments where you're like, uh, I it's broken. You know, badly, you know? <laughs> badly. I do it badly. I keep looking for options. I, I make a lot of lists where I'll have like this character and the main things that are going to happen to them. And this character, right. the main things are going to, and then I try to show where they, those plot lines might come together. And then I will, sometimes I get, I'm devising a new, a new potential world, right? And I thought, oh, I'll buy color. Uh, I'll, I'll buy color cue cards. cards yeah so I'm filling them out will this last who knows I'm I'm always um because I like I don't use Scrivener because it's not tactile mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then I'll get like that this size the two by three things and I'll write I'll do like cross things where stuff has to meet um plot lines that are thematically based in other words I just throw everything I'm doing just like you I throw yeah, everything out there stuff. yeah right and I'll have a file that says last eight chapters and it'll be like you know it'll be numbered you know x1 x2 and then I'll start filling in and then I'll move one to there and then I'll say oh I don't really need that chapter because I can collapse these two and then that kind of moves and then I make notes at the end of the big manuscript I'm writing as I think about what I need in the next chapter. So I use all of those methods. Unfortunately, that means most of it is going on up here and it's mm -hmm. exhaust, it's tiring. It is, yeah. It's yeah. exhausting. There's, there's definitely times where uh, I've, I've likened the, especially the revision process to like a Rubik's cube where you're with 12, layers where you're trying to solve this puzzle and at any moment the whole thing is gonna, is gonna like fall apart on you you know I would love to be uh in one of those writers who can have a full-time assistant who does nothing but collate everything <laughs> right right I, I hear there's probably like three of them in the world but right. you know did it it sounds lovely you know like I mean, someone who's yeah. got like who's who's managing their wiki or something oh, like God. that yeah yeah I'll put this in now. I don't. Um, so, yeah, I wish I had an answer, but I haven't figured one out yet. It, it's endlessly a work in progress. I want to talk a little bit about the cast of thousands, right? Mm. Um, did you ever see that film? I think it was Tom Cruise's debut, Legend. So in legend, a small group, a very small group of like three or four dowdy people go to try to topple the dark Lord who's played by, what's his name anyway. And I was very excited. I'm always excited to see fantasy films and TV shows. And mm -hmm. this, was, this was a long time ago because it was Tom Cruise's debut. <laughs> he had like peach fuzz and he <laughs> was, I, I never found him attractive. So whatever, um, anyway. And I remember watching it saying, this isn't an epic because mm. there's eight people in it. It can't mm -hmm. be an epic. I just, I, and maybe I'm wrong about this because you can have a philosophically profound story with only two people, right? Right. But it right. wasn't an epic. To me, an epic needs a lot of characters. And then you have to have a way to keep them straight in the reader's mind and how they function within the plot and to each other. I, yeah, I, I think that um, the epicness of a story is, is hard to define because there's a certain vibe to it. Um, and I think cast of characters is part of it, um, but not necessarily number of POVs. Right. That's I yeah. yeah, I yeah. think you can definitely have an epic story with a very tight POV, but I think what the epic feel of it comes from 
the amount of connections and relationships. Yes. And uh, and you're right. I, like you can, like you said, you can have a, a profound story with two people, but to have an epic story, I think you have to be looking um, not just at a single person, but at, uh, at effects and repercussions on yeah. many yeah. people and yeah. you can you can do that through relatively tight pov or just a few pov yeah. characters but you can you nevertheless have to create this sense that like the world is bigger than you you know like i think that's yeah it's like the the standing on you know the 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 mountain and and looking across this landscape and and just realizing how big the world is and the way you do that with prose I feel is showing the like the third the fourth the fifth order effects on other people other characters yeah. and I think that's where the cast of characters is important yeah. it's not just well heck I've got a glossary with like 75 named characters in it like that's not really the point the point is that the actions of this of, of these main characters, the events that happen in this story are having these profound effects on many people. And you are, you're seeing that play out um, in, a, in a way that, um, that, the, that the author has to, uh, has to balance sort of the, the, the intimacy of being in a, a character's head um, with, the the narrative the telling of like what is going on in the rest of the world um and so like i i remember when i was writing jade legacy this always being like being that um challenge of like okay we are with this character and how they're feeling and what's going on with them but i've got to skillfully show through their eyes that it's actually having an effect on yeah. this whole city or this whole country or like this entire generation of people. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with everything you said. And one of the things that I think, the one piece of advice I would give people who are trying to do a cast of thousands, because I agree, you don't need a point of view of thousands. Right. But is that I believe that the best way to allow readers, to help readers understand who people are is part, it, it's not just through personality quirks. She was the angry one. She was the, yeah, yeah. you know, the dainty one, but through their relationships, both to the main characters, but yeah. as you say, to the repercussions. And right. because we ourselves live in a network of relationships and that's part of what a big book tries to replicate that these repercussions go outwards, even beyond what we can see. Um, yeah. And that's why I think that cast, that large cast is so great for that, yes. but it is hard, but you have to think about how you can get the reader to keep track of people, not everyone with every story, but the idea that these secondary characters and tertiary characters, they can walk off stage, yeah. off that page, and something is still going on with them. We just don't need to know it. Exactly. Yep. And it forces you to be extremely efficient and economical with your yes. secondary characters because yes. you can't have them run out of control and take up too much page space, but you have to create that sense, like you said, that they are, these are real characters in their own right and they could walk off and have their own, their, they have their own adventures off page. Um, and they are, they're as tied into the story as anyone else, but you're, you're just not seeing their point of view necessarily. So you have, when you have those secondary characters come on, you, I, I always try to uh, find a way in which they make an outsized impact or they, they create an impression on the reader in relatively short amount of time because they're important to the story in, in some way, even if they're not on the page for very long. Um, and that like, I mean, there's some minor characters in my story that I would be glad to kind of follow them and see what they yeah. do off yeah. page. And I think if you can achieve that with your, when you're writing it, hopefully it comes through to the reader as well. 
And sometimes those minor characters capture people's imaginations. They really, yeah, they really write do. fan fiction or, you know, like, I, I, and, and that, that's, that I think is, is, uh, is one of the just joys of like these big stories is that um, there is that room to imagine what are the stories that are not being told. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, I'm going to, we have three minutes left to, because at the top of the hour, the uh, writing group starts. Um, so I'm going to quickly go through, we have two questions. Um, Robin asks from when they came on a half an hour ago, can you do, you know that people couldn't get in, which we do and we're, um, I want to thank Sorry Nathan about that. Yep. And, and whoever he worked with for ha getting anybody on at all. Thank you for being here. Um, can you do a brief recap? And so I want to say to that is Fonda's going to be back in March and we're going to do kind of uh, the, we can do kind of more of a Q and a. Yeah, we'll do, we, we can do yeah. more of a Q and a, and we can talk more about more detail and however, wherever we take it, we'll take it to the next level. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and Jeffrey Jen asks, um, I get the size issue because I'm struggling with the scope, but why not more than three books? If, if it's managed in three chunks, as, in smaller chunks, as you say, with smaller intro sections, um, each book needs to be self-contained. Um, but is there, your title is Go Big or Go Home, but you were saying there is a cap on big. Not sure I agree if it is structured right. This is more a comment than a question. And um, I just want to say that sometimes the sometimes it's smaller installments don't work. Sometimes they sometimes a big story can be cut into smaller installments that work as stepping stones, but sometimes the story is just conceptually big. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a few things going on. Sometimes there is just a uh, publishing constraints exactly and that's what we professional writers work with sometimes your publisher is like we want three books and you have an, a story in your mind and you've got to figure out how to make it work with three books and so sometimes it is it is just literally that um, and then there is also the where does it make sense to break the story because um i did i most certain I, I, some people have asked me did you think about splitting jade legacy up into a smaller no, two smaller no, books no. i'm like no i couldn't have no. it just it doesn't there wasn't i knew what the arc of that story was there was no logical mm -hmm. place to turn that into say three small books it just it wouldn't it would end up being uh just a to be continued or like something that was unsatisfying because it didn't hang together as a whole as a as a book um so you could i you can absolutely have an epic scope story that is um comprised of say seven smaller books if that's if the structure works out well for there to be those seven kind of contained yeah. stepping stones you can have an epic story that is like priory of the orange tree and is one massive volume um you so it really depends on kind of where it makes sense um, for the story to be paused or broken, uh, as well as those, those publishing constraints that we talked about. Um, and is there a cap on big? Uh, I mean, I, I work with a, what is it? I have to set for me, what is the cap um, on yeah. that story? Because uh, that's how I work as a writer. I want to know that I can deliver a, a story that um, is, that hangs together, that has a satisfying conclusion. Um, and, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm not gonna just write into the wilderness. Like I, I personally need to know what the cap on big is. And that cap can be this, you know, or it could be this. <laughs> right. And right. I, have to, I have to know what that is. Yeah, and that, and that gets back to where we started for, for Rob, but I'm so sorry that we had these problems. Well, they'll be, that, that, be on the, YouTube. You can watch yeah, the be beginning. Up. Yeah. And then we'll, and we'll come back, but it comes back to that basic thing with conceptualize your story. That's where you start. So I'm going to say, 
Thank you to those who finally got in here. A huge thanks to Nathan for dealing with this complicated situation. Um, and thank you to Fonda thank for you. coming with me. Your, your Jade Legacy is out now. Is it actually in the store? It is. Yet? It's out on November 30th. So if okay. you're watching this now, it'll be out in just over a week. And if well, that doesn't give you much time can... to read Jade City and Jade War, because they are big books. So. <laughs> they are. <laughs> Um, and actually, I didn't invite you on just because that book is coming out now. It just happened to work out that way. It worked out very nicely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thank you all. Um, I'll be back. I got to be my outro. Oh, anyway, I'll be back um, next month on December 19th. For those of you who weren't able to get to Worldcon in person, um, Anne Leckie and I will be talking about character relationships and how they can, the relationships between people can help you world build um, and That's create awesome. stronger narratives. I know, Anne Leckie. Yeah, Leckie. I know. <laughs> um, so thank you. Um, and I'm going to ask, uh, that's it. That's episode one, season two of Narrative Worlds with complete with technical problems. And I'm going to tell the person dealing with the recording that they can cut now. <laughs> We're still on. Yeah. And Nathan, thank you, everyone. Back. Thank you, Sifwa, for hosting. And Kate. Oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot that part. Host. I didn't read my outro. Thank you, as always, to Sifwa and the Nebula Conference for allowing this to happen, for making a platform for it. Mm -hmm.